Hello, welcome back to another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm your host, Stephen Roy Goodman. Today we're going to be speaking about academic freedom and its importance in our society. Our guest today is Daniel Gordon, who's a professor at UMass Amherst, and his new book is What is Academic Freedom? Welcome, Dan. Thanks for having me, Steve. Well, thanks for coming here to Washington. We're delighted to have you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what is academic freedom? Uh, we talk about it, we hear about it, but what is academic freedom? Sure. In a nutshell, academic freedom is the right of professors to do research and to teach in a, as they wish. It protects professors from outside interference, like from governors, legislators, and public opinion. And why is that important? Well, the general theory behind academic freedom is that social progress depends on the growth of knowledge, and the growth of knowledge, in turn, depends on having spaces in society, notably universities, where people can ask any questions they wish and can feel comfortable pursuing answers that may incur popularity, unpopularity in the short run. But what about, let's say I worked at IBM, can I posit something that's unpopular if I work at IBM? Well, IBM produces business machines, and um, that, allow, that requires a certain degree of creativity on the people who work there, and they need some freedom to do that. But the principle behind academic freedom is we're not producing anything in particular. We're producing knowledge in general, knowledge across a wide range of disciplines. And uh, we can't really predict in advance where knowledge will take us. We need a group of individuals, namely professors, who have the utmost freedom uh, to do as they wish. And what about a junior professor or a graduate student or an undergraduate student? Do they have the same protections or levels of academic freedom? If we focus on students, for example, the traditional concept of academic freedom in the U.S. doesn't actually include students. But the history reveals that at certain times there have been movements to promote student rights. And now we're starting to get more into the complexity of the idea of academic freedom. What about when the freedom of the student bumps up against the freedom of the professor? So imagine a student is in a class, let's say it's an engineering class, and the engineering professor starts to give a speech against Donald Trump or criticizing Israel, something that seems totally off topic. At that point, the student could say, you're violating my academic freedom because you're violating my ability to learn in a, in a good environment. And the professor can say, well, I'm exercising my academic freedom in the sense of I'm expressing myself, um, uh, exercising free speech. So there are a number of questions here about whose freedom counts more. Is academic freedom the same thing as free speech or not? Uh, what I would say is that the first half of the 20th century, if we look at this more historically, is a sort of struggle for academic freedom against blatant forms of uh, power and intervention by governors, legislators, and so on. For example, the effort to ban the teaching of evolution. Second half of the 20th century is more of a struggle over the meaning of academic freedom, and that's the state we're in now. And getting to that issue of academic freedom, there seems to be a lot of debate as to what can be addressed without being so controversial. Yeah, well, there's, there's the political correctness factor at some colleges and universities, which tends to create a repressive environment within the university. So in some cases, we can see that the threats to academic freedom are actually not coming from outside. They're coming from within the university, from students who are doing a sort of cancel culture, or from administrators who are promoting very particular social values and calling out professors who disagree with them. The very first chapter was about Angela Davis. So maybe if you could explain a little bit about why, that's, why you chose to start your book that way. Well, who is Angela Davis? Um, today, Angela Davis is pretty widely known as a leader of the prison abolition movement. And uh, she's had a very distinguished career as a critic and activist against uh, racism. Uh, around 1970, she was a 25-year-old philosophy professor at UCLA. And she was fired by the administration 
for expressing her radical ideas in a series of speeches outside of class. Um, and um, this led to prolonged uh, series of court cases and controversies among academics about whether she was justly fired or not. Um, she was fired um, successfully, so to speak. It was partly because she was only on a one-year contract, which made it easier, renewable each year, which made it easier to fire her than if she had been a permanent or tenured uh, professor. But the case is raised enduring questions. Um, what to make of a particularly radical professor who believes that the whole point of being a professor is not so much to pursue objective knowledge, but to transform society by transforming students. By, um, some people would use the word indoctrination, by indoctrinating students, she didn't use that term. Um, so, uh, underlying question here is, can we really distinguish between the pursuit of knowledge and the pursuit of politics? And that's where you get a basic divide, more or less between traditionalists who believe there actually is a clear-cut difference between being an academic and pursuing knowledge objectively and in a disinterested manner versus the increasing number of professors since the 1960s who think that you can't really make that distinction that everything is political. But what about how it's perceived? So outside of the academy, if people perceive, the general public perceives that, that professors are indoctrinating students, to use the word you just used, then why should the American public support American universities as much as they have if a number of people think that that's okay? Well, that's a good question, and it's a really hard question. There is actually something like the Declaration of Independence for professors. It was called the Declaration of the Principles of Academic Freedom. It goes all the way back to 1915, but it's still the most respected statement on the subject. And it says that in a modern democracy, we have political freedom, which is good, but that there's a huge risk that public opinion will become repressive. This is informed by some of the great political theorists like John Stuart Mill and his essay on liberty and Alexis de Tocqueville and his fear of the role that public opinion could play in the United States. And the idea is the university has to be a refuge from that pressure. And ideally, the public itself will be educated through universities to appreciate the need for the independence of professors. The reality is more complicated because sometimes professors do go off on the deep end, either in their teaching or what they tweet on social media, and it catches the public's attention. And um, the professor in certain cases does need to be disciplined. And so we're living in this world now where we're trying to figure out what is really covered by academic freedom and what is just plain irresponsible. And in your mind, is let's say somebody does something outside of their job. You teach at the University of Massachusetts, so let's assume you behave badly in a grocery store in Amherst, Massachusetts, regarding something that has nothing to do with the academic enterprise. Is that covered? Now that's a good one. Believe it or not, some people these days would argue that it is. That because I'm an academic, I carry this freedom everywhere I go and that my role is to sort of be a provocateur, you know, what Socrates in ancient times called a gadfly. Now, of course, this wouldn't cover me if I commit an act of violence, but it will tend to cover my speech. There is a contrary view, which I lean to myself, which is that the academic freedom is really designed to protect me when I'm engaged in specifically academic activities, like teaching my students in my classroom. I'm the one who gets to grade their papers, uh, not the governor of Massachusetts. I'm the one who decides what courses I'm going to teach. If I'm writing a te textbook on American history, I decide what the table of contents will be. When I'm beyond this range of academic activities, it can become absurd to say I can do whatever I want because I'm an academic. To sum it up, you can take the phrase academic freedom and really parse it. Do you want to emphasize the word freedom, 
or do you want to wor emphasize the word academic? Alternatively, is academic freedom the right of academics to do whatever they wish whenever they wish, or is, the is it the right of academics to do a relatively small number of things that have distinctly academic features to them? At this point, it's about 50-50 if you put a microphone in front of the professors at a variety of universities. A lot of people simply haven't thought it through, so they're just giving you a gut reaction. And the result is the answers are all over the place. And finally, it's worth noting that there is no organization that officially defines academic freedom. There is one or organization called the American Association of University Professors. That's the closest thing we have. It was founded in 1915. It still exists. But it's not like the Bar Association or the American Medical Association, which can actually punish people or disbar people for violating its principles. It just issues documents and makes statements. But it too has changed its ideas over the course of time. It originally took the more professional conception of academic freedom, which is it's limited to very intellectual and academic activities on the university. Now it tends to equate academic freedom with freedom of speech, a kind of super right of freedom of speech given to professors. What about other countries? Is this <laughs> the reality in other countries as well? Well, there, there are whole parts of the world that don't have academic freedom. And you can see this plainly in certain parts of the world where the government will punish people who promote democratic ideas or even have students read pro-democracy authors uh, just to be better informed. So that's uh, forbidden, you know, in large stretches of the world. We're if we're talking about um, the so-called Western world, uh, North America, Europe, other countries influenced by them, such as universities uh, in India, uh, South Africa, uh, people will recognize the term academic freedom. But I think the United States um, is the country which has the tendency to take any right or any freedom and test the limit, push the boundary. Why can't I do this? Uh, today, there are a lot of issues associated with um, what professors say on, on social media, and I think that would probably be strictly regulated in a lot of other countries. Social media are more strictly regulated in other countries to begin with. I wanted to get back to the issue, if I could, about the politics of this. So, I mean, obviously you're an expert in this subject, but if in fact there's a, this lively debate that's going on, I'm not sure that the American public is really uh, paying attention to this lively debate. They're only seeing the larger than life cases that are in the newspaper or on social media. So they're not really debating, you know, the nuances of academic freedom. They're saying, well, this is crazy. This professor is saying something that's so far out of the mainstream. Why are we spending millions and millions and millions of dollars to support this? Well, I'm not yet convinced that the public is not attuned to what the real issues are. I mean, a, a real professor named Ward Churchill shortly after 9-11 published an article online in which he attacked the, the, the victims of 9-11 who were working in the World Trade Center and basically said they deserved it, okay? And um, the governor, uh, this was Colorado, um, was all over this and urged the university uh, to fire him. And this became a protracted uh, court case. Um, so on the one hand, and, and the public was, in, was into this. Um, this was featured on many television programs and written up in newspapers, and, and I think the case does encapsulate, I mean, it's unusual, but it does encapsulate some of the basic dilemmas of academic freedom. On the one hand, what he said was inappropriate, grossly inoffensive, grossly offensive, poorly timed, and just kind of dumb. On the other hand, he was trying to draw attention to American colonialism and the hatred that the country has allegedly inspired in the Middle East and that can lead to acts of terrorism against the United States. Now, I don't lean in that direction of analysis, 
but he is a specialist on colonialism and, and um, uh, the misdeeds, let's say, of American foreign policy. And so he was expressing himself with some expertise, at least in the background, um, if not sort of exactly what he said. What he said didn't sound very academic. But um, it's a close case. And um, the university ended up firing him for a totally different reason, which it appointed a committee to systematically inspect all of his publications. Uh, and again, this is a man named Ward Churchill, for errors in plagiarism. And they found some instances of plagiarism. And they fired him from that. He, in turn, argued in court that the only reason they appointed the committee was because of his un, uh, unpopular article and that he had been singled out for this inquiry and that that in and of itself was a violation of his freedom. Now, he ended up uh, losing, but it looks to me like there are a lot of issues here. Maybe not all of them reached the general public, but some of them did. Why wouldn't a junior professor who's not terribly political avoid the most controversial things they could and A, not tweet about controversial things and B, try to teach courses that are less political? So if you mean to suggest that they fear they may not get tenure, which is to say get a permanent appointment, um, if they overstep some boundary, well, academic freedom is designed to protect them from that. But then there's the purely professional question of whether they of whether they should be, say, promoting their personal political values in the classroom. I personally think they shouldn't, and that one should be as discreet as possible about where one stands on current events. Does that mean one avoids controversy entirely? No, but if we go back to this document I mentioned, the Declaration of Academic Freedom, framed a century ago, it's actually a beautiful text, a very thoughtful text, and it says that when it comes to controversies in which which have not been resolved, the duty of the professor is to make students aware of different points of view. That means talking about them, having students read about them, and giving them the opportunity to explore different viewpoints and express their own. Some people would argue that the university is really to promote knowledge, not necessarily to take apart our entire society. So, why are we putting so much of an emphasis on what the needs of the professors are relative to the needs of the students or relative to the needs of the communities that are hosting the universities? Well, I think there's an ideal middle ground here. And my thought, I think, is consistent with the spirit of your question. I think we want most, if not all, professors to um, be professional particularly in the classroom, because you're dealing with young people who A, are very impressionable, and B, don't have the same power as the professor. You know, students will tend to pick up what they're supposed to say to a professor if the professor is very opinionated or politically biased. Rare is the student who will talk back to a professor on a particular issue that the professor is passionate about. And extremely rare is the student who could frame a criticism more generally, like professors aren't supposed to be doing this. You know, tell us you know, what the state of knowledge is, not how we should change the world. Okay? And at that level, I think the public has a right to be concerned. Because we live in a democracy, and the, the people is uh, the source of sovereignty. The professors are not the source of sovereignty. So I think the greatest weakness of those on, say, the extreme left, who argue that everything is political, so I might as well be political in the classroom, the greatest weakness of that position is once you say everything is political, then you're basically saying everything should be decided by the general public. The original theory of academic freedom is some things are not political, they're based on expertise, like theoretical physics. The public should not be telling people uh, or pro prohibiting professors from exploring in this field and sharing their conclusions with professors. And it's only one step away to evolutionary biology. That's a matter of professional expertise among biologists. So um, uh, there you have it. 
I think one problem, though, is even if we agree, as you and I seem to agree, that there really is a distinction between knowledge and politics, how do you enforce it? Who enforces it? You can't punish a professor every time a student is offended by something a professor says. My religious uh, sensibility was offended by what the professor says. The professor offended my, my political beliefs. And students will sometimes misunderstand professors. I say teach a course on the history of political ideas and I want students to be familiar with the most influential ones. So I have them read Karl Marx's The Communist Manifesto. There will inevitably be a student who thinks I'm promoting communism by having them read the manifesto. Now, over time, I think I can explain to students and make them see that that's not the case, but imagine that such a student makes a complaint, it gets some traction in the general public, and, and before I know it, you know, people are, are, are portraying me as, uh, as a highly biased professor. So um, one challenge here is to come up with a process. And uh, many, us, many of us believe that every university should have an academic freedom committee consisting of professors to look into these cases. So at your university, is there such a committee? We don't have a committee. We happen to have a unionized faculty. And so I pay union dues. And one of the benefits is the union will go to bat for me if I fall under fire for practically any reason. So for all practical purposes, it becomes a kind of academic uh, freedom committee. But what it won't do is discipline me if I violate professional norms. As a, as a union, it's there to protect me. It's not there to censure me. As I envision an academic freedom committee, it would do both. It would tell a professor when the professor has gone too far. It would tell the engineering professor, don't give long political speeches in the classroom. That's just not about engineering. That's not what the students are paying for. That risks alienating the public. It has all kinds of bad consequences. And do you see a distinction then between a public university and a private university in that regard? Wow, that's a good one. And maybe a reason you ask the question is because when it comes to free speech, there actually is a difference. The U.S. Constitution gives special protection to people in state organizations. Uh, the First Amendment says Congress shall pass no law abridging the freedom of speech, and over time this has been applied to states, local governments, so the University of Massachusetts would be a case in point. So if the university administration tried to stifle my academic freedom and is reacting to something I say in class, I'm, I could evoke freedom of speech as well as academic freedom, and that's going to make it tougher to discipline me than if I'm at a private college. I think overall, though, it's, we're in a state now, or a condition now, where every college and university, whether it's private or public, has to become clear about what it means by academic freedom, because as I said, there's no organization that's really resolving these issues for everyone that has a power of enforcement. And I think what I really want to see happen, and what I've tried to promote with my book, which traces the history of debates about academic freedom, what I want to see happen is simply a higher level discussion of these issues at each and every campus, rather than people automatically assuming that academic freedom means that, I, what, that a professor can say anything, um, or you know, automatically jumping on the case of a professor who violates the sensibility of uh, politically correct people. We just need a better conversation about this topic. Well, that's why I'm glad we're having this conversation. And let's expand it a little bit, if we could, to high school students and high school teachers. What about high school teachers who are teaching tough subjects that are controversial, like history or, or ethics? What protections are there for high school teachers? So I will tend to see a difference between being a professor and a high school teacher. And I begin by illustrating that by going back to uh, the theory of evolution again. So in the 1920s, several states banned it. And if you look at the, um, the laws, they actually include universities. 
Now, I'm, I wouldn't defend the banning of evolution in high schools, but I think the banning of evolution in universities is patently more absurd because to determine whether the theory of evolution is even true or not, we need academics, we need biologists and others to explore it and to share their findings with their colleagues and with students to bring university students into the process of that exploration. High school is a little bit different. I talked about university students being impressionable, high school students even, even more so. And I think there's more scope to regulate what high school teachers teach and how they have to teach than there is at a university. In other words, I agree with the proposition that a university should have the utmost academic freedom, whatever it actually means. High school teachers less so. However, there are court cases which focus on high school teachers, say, who have been fired merely for belonging to a certain political party. That's not acceptable. High school teachers fired not for trying to indoctrinate students, but simply drawing students' attention to certain controversial issues. I think in certain subjects like social studies and history, that's what they're supposed to do. Is there anything else that you would like to say to a Higher Education Today audience before we say goodbye that I didn't ask you about academic freedom? Well, if people are up for doing a little reading online, I draw your attention to the 1915 Declaration of Academic Freedom. All you really have to do is Google those words or words like them. It's a readable, fascinating document, and I think it makes a really solid point when it's said there's no rights without responsibilities. And it starts to outline some of the responsibilities and not just rights associated with academic freedom. I mentioned one, and I'll just reiterate it, that when you're teaching a super controversial topic, you expose students to different points of view, you, and you don't just summarize them in your own words, but you let people speak for the different point of views, either by bringing in guest speakers or having students read them. Well, fair enough. Thank you very much, Dan, for making the trip down here, and thank you for coming on the show. Thanks so much for having me, Steve. Well, if you would like additional information about Daniel Gordon at the University of Massachusetts, please go to umass.edu. If you'd like to send, to me, send a note to me at the show, please go ahead and do so by sending an email to highereducationtoday at topcolleges.com. And thank you for watching. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, and you've been watching Higher Education today.